Now, we're moving on to the next part of today, which is the Q&A session. So I'd like to bring back Jared and also welcome Pierre Coyle, Managing Director of PhD, to the stage. Now, we've had a lot of great questions that have been sent through during today's session, so thank you all for contributing to that. We're going to go through a bit of Q&A live on stage today, but also um, at the end, we'll look to throw to the floor for a couple of extra questions. And if you could please, when you do stand up, we've got a couple of mics coming around from the MFA team. Please stand up, say your name, where you're from, and for any questions today, we have got one of Jared's books to, to hand out. All right. So, jumping straight into it. Um, I think a fantastic question, probably for you, Jared, really around why do so many people have difficulty combining that strength and warmth in terms of their leadership style? I've been pondering that question a long time. Um, I know that there are there's some sociological stuff and there's some neurological stuff and some biological stuff. Mm, sure. So the sociological is that we've often gendered strength and warmth. Uh, males have to be tough and vulnerable, women nurturing warm. And we grow up teaching that men and women are binary. They're either male, yeah, as a kid, I'm a boy, I'm a girl. And the good news about breaking all of that down is we can actually say, no, that's bullshit. Um, we don't have to subscribe to that sociological condition. Mm. The second is neurological. So we've actually got two different neural networks, one which is focused on task, the other is focused on people. One is closed and focused, the other is open and receptive. And when one is activated, the other one shuts down. And when that one activates, when the other one activates, the other one shuts down. The problem is the task focus one is the one we teach in things like MBAs. That's not leadership. You can't be a leader unless you are open and receptive. So what we, it's partly to do with neurological functioning and we need to learn how to micro switch between those two networks very quickly. And the third thing is biological. Sometimes, unfortunately, what happens is that um, when we get into conflict with other people, this conflict of ideas, our, there's some hormonal responses, chemicals that actually cause us to actually double down and become closed and focused on the outcome rather than being open in the conversation. So um, for some of us, that's a particular trap. I might pick up on something you just said there, and I'm just going to... There's always a bloody quote that I say that's a bit outrageous, so sorry, but it's relevant. So um, I've been told for my whole working life that I've got big dick energy <laughs> and I'm a woman obviously and like a very nurturing mother and I would like to think a nurturing leader but often like in that gender space that you were just talking about at the start people sort of say oh she's got you know she yeah she's like holds it like a man or she's got yeah. like masculine energy around her and I wore that as a badge for a long time but I think that capped my vulnerability and then I sort of thought about it and went well hang on a minute like you don't need to have a penis to have like big energy um, and so sort of reframed it for myself and I've, I'm a mother of two sons as well which is really interesting another layer because I want to make sure that they don't learn those stereotypes and that they see me as almost genderless right because it's like you don't need a gender to do a certain job but it just really resonated when you said that because for a long time that was my label and that was my brand and um, I think I've done a decent job you know recently around all that stuff with personal work I think is a big big thing because I now sort of know how to turn that up and down and uh, it hasn't affected my confidence so I'm always very like sort of big in my delivery or very deliberate in the way I speak to people but I've totally reframed that that's anything to do with the appendage that you have or don't have or you know the energy that's masculine or feminine and I think it's freed me a little bit to just be myself which is interesting. Mm. I love that answer. Mm. Amazing. I think that was uh, that was a big question that came out of the, the floor as well around gender and the role and does that have any dominance over which tendencies you tend to typically go for? So I think that was a great answer for that. Thank you. Um, and Peter, I think for you, as a, as a point for the industry, do you feel that there's any different leadership styles, so that warmth versus strength, depending on the type of relationship? So how you would lead your team versus how you would lead client relationships? Yeah. And what impact that has? It's a really good question, and I think some people do operate in that way, but I think it's when you can integrate, like, the two and have and be the same person in all relationships, I think it's probably the best way to do it. Is that, That's my bias, at least. So I turn up 
I think, in the exact same way with clients, with media owners and with my um, team, generally speaking. I think maybe, like, the difference comes in terms of how much warmth and how much strength versus the situation at hand or the conversation that needs to be had or, you know, maybe the... Um, the strength of the relationship comes into it as well. So whether you've known somebody for a long time versus just met them, how annoyed they are with you, you know, what the biggest stresses are in terms of that relationship, that's, I think, where the levers change, not with the type of person or the type of relationship that it is, would be my answer. I love the how you just responded. Made practical sense of something that's really important to understand about that model is that they're continuums mm. and they are... It's a continuum of strength through to passiveness. And you can choose to be anywhere on that continuum you want to be. As in warmth, you can dial up your warmth when it's necessary and helpful, yeah. and you can dial it down where it may be less helpful. But it's a choice. You can choose if you're conscious. I think the underlying piece of that is the integrity piece that you had on a, on a slide before. It's like you can be less warm and more strong in a certain situation or the other way around, but like you always have to operate with integrity, how you would like to be treated, you know, um, lead by example, all that sort of stuff. So as long as you're doing that, I think there is strategy in things like being passive at certain points or being extra strong or, you know, um, keeping a relationship at a bit more of an arm's length, but still being really warm. It just depends on the situation. Like it's all very much whatever needs to happen on the day. <laughs> I think with that, looking at that self-awareness and I love, I love the example of that chef going from how he's managed one successful restaurant and then into two where he's trying to take the same approach to each. Are there any practical tips for how you would look at that inner you and how you would actually then apply it to different scenarios and how you build as a leader? So in that particular skill set or just more broadly? Just more broadly in yeah. how we adapt to different um, stages as we go through leadership. Yeah. There, I think there is, um, and you've probably, I, I, and I, I've seen the list of topics that you've covered in these breakfast series, and probably the answer to that question might already be, it's been shared with you. You know, For example, you had a session which is around questions and curiosity and the impact that that has. There was, there was a session recently about listening and how do you use listening. Um, there's been sessions about being sort of you know, open. As, uh, if you're open, then you can actually encourage more innovation. So they're all of those skill sets. I think that the, the challenge is how do we remain conscious about trying to, to work on something? And there's a wonderful um, experience that I had where Ang um, <coughs> the, one of the former CEOs of BHP, um, Andrew McKenzie, um, and I hold Andrew to be a great leader because what he did is he took an organisation that was very machine-like, only interested in profitability and outcomes and become much more human. Uh, um, and he, he talked about how he, he was asked how he grew as a leader and he said, I just, he said, very simple, I just find one habit that is, would be helpful, or one technique, and I work on it and work on it and work on it and work on it until I, it's a habit. Mm -hmm. And then only then do I then pick the next thing. And he said, some of those habits have taken a long time to break through and form. Because his view is that it's easy to conspire with yourself to give up on doing something hard and get di by letting yourself get distracted by the new shiny thing that you're going to work on. So sometimes just choosing one thing and just working it and working it and working it. Mm. I was just saying this to my table, am I pointing at the right table? Um, and this is a lesson for me, it's, I've struggled with it for my whole career, I thought I was getting really good at it, then last night I had this massive just like, why am I doing this, this like my life is crazy, I'm making my life too hard. <laughs> um, and I sort of just boiled it back to like, creating space for yourself. So whether you run two restaurants or 20 restaurants, whether you've got a team of 25 or 160, like it's on me to work out how to protect my energy, my space, my time, to be able to do a really good job of thinking and being strategic and present with my team. And then also being a great mum when I get home. So like last night was not a good night. I was yelling, there was washing everywhere. We had KFC for dinner, like it was <laughs> hectic. Um, but then this morning I woke up and I listened to you and I was like, it's on me to say no to things or to protect the time and space. So I think the scale at which you operate, whether it's like a team of four or a team of 200, it's, you need to adapt your mental availability um, to do the right job. I love that, setting those clear boundaries between. Yeah. I'm going to cancel every meeting out of my diary for the next two weeks. <laughs>
just kidding. I love that. Yeah. yeah, 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 except cookies, yeah. All right, before we throw open to the floor for questions, one um, last question from the, the slide up. Can anyone, and this is for both of you, can anyone be an extraordinary leader? Yeah, that's a good question. I think absolutely you can. You have to want to be, though, I think. Like, there's no point being a reluctant leader. I've had a few of those and it's a bit shit. Um, I would say, though, it's cliched, but it's very true and you would agree because I've just seen two hours of it. You need to lead yourself first. So if you can't lead yourself in your career, your life, your aspirations, your motivation, whatever, like, don't bother trying to lead other people because you will make it too hard for yourself and people will know. So spend the time understanding the beliefs you need to change or the things you need to push yourself through to get to a point where you are taking your own, like, control of your own life and your own person and your own, pers you know, personal relationships, and then you can be a leader. Mm. I think you're right. I think anyone can be... Anyone can take up leadership because it's an act. Mm. It's an act. It's a choice to act, to lead. If you've got a big enough reason... Something that matters to you enough. And if it matters to you enough to do it well, then you will inevitably start to use life as the laboratory for running all the experiments you need to learn how to be a better leader. Because every single experience you have can teach you something. Yeah. I think the misnomer is that you need a team to be a leader, but you actually don't. Like, sometimes it helps because then people, like, come <coughs> along on the journey and, you know, you can feel like you're teaching people things and learning from them and all that sort of stuff, but like ultimately you can be a leader as an individual and I think the quicker you learn that in media, the more you're going to stand out because if you just wait to be fed what the next thing is or you, you know, um, don't take control of where you're going or what your job is or like anyone can be a leader, even a coordinator who's two weeks into the job, like the way you approach tasks, the way you show up at work, the way you're positive, all that sort of stuff. Like, that's leadership. It's not just about leading a big team. Okay, so now open to the floor. Um, we've got uh, Kel and Tani with some mics going around, so please raise your hand if you've got any questions for the panel. And you get a fantastic book. <laughs> oh, Simon. <laughs> Someone from my team, great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so sorry, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask a very controversial question, but I'm trying to articulate it in my brain, so I'm struggling. Um, there's not many companies that you could work for. Like, obviously, there's a few agencies within Sydney, and then there's a few um, client groups that we could work on. And each one has that one primary leader. Um, what if there are leaders that have gaps in their leadership, and you feel like you would like to be part of the organisation as a whole, but the leader still has gaps. How do you, I guess, lead up? Mm. Yeah, that's my question. <laughs> Good question. Do you want me to go first? Yeah, please. Um, I would say even if they've got gaps, you can learn something from them. So learn from the positives, but also learn from their gaps. And, like, often I've taken things from leaders who have gaps where I've gone, it's, it could be as simple as I want to work for, I don't want to work for someone else like that again. Like that's a learning, right? Because then you make the next job decision based on who you surround yourself with. But you could also, there's an opportunity there for you to go, that person's gaps are this. Do I, do I have something that will fill that gap? Then that's really interesting, a really interesting dynamic because you will learn and grow and fill that gap and then there's a massive opportunity for you. So, like, the big joke is I'm really crap at detail, right? Like, and so if anyone in my team jumps at the ability, like, to fill that gap, I'm like, oh, my God, yeah, come with me, let's go. But for years I tried to pretend I could do that thing, whereas now I show up and I'm like, I'm not going to be the guy that does the, you know, the notes from the meeting. But there's always someone to do those things. So I would look at the gaps and go, can I learn from them, can I fill them, to those two things. And then the other thing is be really deliberate about where you want to work and who you want to work with. And if there's too many gaps, don't... Do it, because you'll just stunt yourself and get frustrated and it'll be annoying. So they're my three things. Um, I would add to that that you know, leadership is not unidirectional. You know, so if you think about it in terms of authority structures leading down, the work of leadership by definition is to influence and mobilise others. So that can be this way and the authority structure can be that way too. You can influence your boss. But the, uh, the, the difference is that when you're leading this way, you have this authority which if you 
want to, you can probably adopt control and command and demand compliance and maybe in some way you might get some begrudging compliance. You just can't do that with peers and you certainly can't do it up. The only thing you've got to work with is what that person cares about. You can't lead people from where you're at, you have to lead them from where they're at. You have to step into their shoes and think, what do they care about? What pulls them forward? What are their dreams, their hopes, their aspirations? And what holds them back? What are their fears, anxieties, worries and concerns? And once I know that about someone, I can help them move forward. I might be able to play a role. So if I can connect with them doing something that would allow them to achieve what they care about, then that's influence. They will act of their own volition. My job is to get, get out of my own self-centeredness enough to know what that person cares about and what matters to them. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question from the floor. Mike's on the way. Hi, um, I'm Lucille from Zenith. Um, <clears throat> I feel like we have almost we, we present it as being a leader is a goal in a career, and I feel that there are some personalities that are more um, extroverts, that are more like not born to be a leader, but maybe easier for them. Um, so my question is more, can you actually succeed in your career and um, grow in your career without having this ultimate goal to be a leader, which can be a bit scary for some, I think, people and personalities? Mm. I think definitely you can, but you probably need to own it, I think. So it's it's self-awareness to be able to say, I don't want that path. But you, what I said before about leading yourself, you always have to do that. I don't think there's, there's a way you can not lead yourself. But if you want to be a specialist or somebody who is a like subject matter expert or like somebody who um, you know is product focused, all that sort of stuff. I think you can absolutely do that without aspiring to you know be front and center in doing these things and being on stage and having huge teams and all that sort of stuff. But unless you um, are upfront about that and self aware and claim it, I think it's probably hard because you'll get shoved into jobs that you know you need to manage people and then you're up this ladder. <laughs> and so I think yeah, being self aware enough to say I don't want that is empowering and also as a practical leader, like in terms of me trying to manage 160 people, we need people like that. Like we need people who are really excited and happy to come in and do an awesome job of what they love to do and bring thinking and inspiration to that, but not always be pushing up to the next thing. So like you can get really well rewarded, looked after, paid, all that sort of stuff if you if you own that spot. And there's, there's definitely a space for those people in organisations everywhere. Mm. And if I, if I just go with, you know, regardless of the position, I just want to make a contribution, a meaningful contribution. The reality is, unless you just work by yourself and you live in a cave, to make a meaningful contribution in the world today, we often have to collaborate with other mm. people. So I may not have an authority position, an anointed position of leader or executive or head of or manager but I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to find that my ability to achieve what I care about will at some point get limited by my ability to influence and mobilise other people. Mm. So I'm, and I find I often work with senior professionals, experts, who've hit that boundary where they've decided, I don't want to be a leader. But that's an authority position. They have to ask themselves, I don't want to lead. They're two very different things. Yeah. And being conscious about that choice. I, I may not want to be the CEO, but I still want to be able to influence and mobilise people. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you both very much for your time on that. We've got time for one more? All right. It's time for one more. Up the back. Hello, guys. Um, I'm Karthik from Havas. Uh, you spoke earlier about um, empathising with people and uh, trying to put yourself in our shoes. Um, I just quite recently, I mean, earlier 10 people used to have 20 different opinions among them, and nowadays those same 10 people have 200 different opinions among them. Uh, how would you suggest as a leader to make sure that you are able to check all the boxes aligned with all of those 200 different opinions, or even, for example, the opinions that matter, and steer them in the direction that you want to? Considering people are not very receptive to change, some people still believe the earth is flat, so how do you kind of go around doing that? 
Um, I think for me it depends on the issue. So like if we're trying to get consensus on whether we're getting crunchy peanut butter or smooth peanut butter, um, <laughs> like it's important everyone has a quick vote and then we go with the majority. But if there's something around like really <laughs> important around like visions, values, we're changing the organisation, like people need to feel heard and that can be done in many different ways. That can be a quick survey all the way through to in-depth interviews with every staff member, right? So I think setting up the setting up, up front and through your behaviours that we want to listen as much as possible and we're always there to hear what your concerns are means that you don't always need to go to the level of speaking to the 200 people and getting, you know, the, the minute detail around their, um, their opinions. So, like, I think building trust and an open communication is probably the biggest thing because then when it comes to a point where sometimes leaders have to make decisions that are just decided and we have to, you know, do that, to be able to give context around that and also the trust that you're doing the right thing and you ultimately know what the sentiment of the company is um, helps part pave the way for those bigger decisions. So I think it's different in every situation, but I would hope that being communicative and vulnerable and all that um, up front means that when bigger decisions happen, people are generally on board. Mm. There was a, does anyone remember the Port Arthur massacre? Yeah, that was on my birthday. Was it? Mm. Golly. <coughs> yeah. uh, 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 one of my partners in the firm that I was running at the time, he was there. He was in the cafeteria. Well, that's a way better story than my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> would rather, he would have rather been at your birthday. Sorry, yes, true. Um, that whole event led to some decisions that automatics, guns, etc. There needed to be some version of gun control. And so John Howard, the Prime Minister at the time, decided to act on that. And he spoke to a lot of people. It wasn't just a unilateral decision. He spoke to a lot of people. In fact, and the, particularly the, one of the most, uh, the strongest oppositional groups was, was the Farmers' Federation and the Nationals particularly. Um, and I, I remember really clearly, because I was a teenager at the time, there was a, there was a sorry, as a, I was in my 20s at the time, there was a moment where... Um, the, farmers, the, the head of the Farmers' Federation had gone to Canberra to lobby against it and they'd had a meeting with the Prime Minister and, he ca and the media were interviewing him afterwards and they asked the question, how did it go? And he said, he said we went in and we shared, we shared our opinion and we felt like the Prime Minister genuinely listened to us, mm. that he actually heard us. And afterwards, John Howard still made what was a tough decision that people weren't going to like. But when you feel like you've actually genuinely been heard, even though the decision hasn't gone in your favour, then you're much more likely to be able to get on board with that decision. It's when you feel like you haven't been heard in a, for a decision that impacts you. So I think the warmth is the willingness to listen. The strength is the willingness to still make a decision knowing that some people may not be happy with that outcome. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Pia. It's been a really valuable conversation uh, as we as the industry have the purpose of being We Are The Changers. Um, this is really great inspiration for us, for everyone to be able to take some action today. So can everyone join me in, please? Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you. Thank you.